Um, my name is Carrie Donahue Bremner. I work at Spears & Major as an associate partner and I'm based out of Edinburgh, London and internationally, depending on where the projects take me. I fell into lighting completely accidentally. I studied uh, art, design and architecture at the Red Island School of Design in Providence um, and ended up working in architecture in Edinburgh. A number of my friends were working at Spears & Major, it was called at the time, and just kind of really organically I got a job there because I wanted to work a little bit more in the nitty-gritty of projects um, and they needed somebody to do that at the time. So, and that is about 20 years ago now. So. I'm Clementine Fletcher-Smith. I work at Spears & Major in London. Um, I've been here 13 years, so not quite the same. Catching up. Um, I got into architectural lighting through studying architecture. Um, I studied it as the most, what I thought the most sort of academic design degree I could do before then figuring out which design niche I wanted to work in. And I met someone in the lighting industry in my third year and I was suddenly like, oh, I didn't really realise that existed. Um, and I kind of, I had always been interested in lighting, I'd always made textiles to make lampshades, I used to like light my room when I was little and show my parents and things like that. So I, um, I just started applying for jobs, started at Spears & Major as a very junior assistant designer and then worked my way up and studied, um, did the Bartlett um, Masters at Bartlett, about three years into working here, um, and then have been here ever since. One of the things that makes Spears Major so unique is that we don't have a specific specialism. We kind of we focus on all sorts of different types of projects, and that's what makes it so enjoyable to work um, for a place like this. The breadth of project types, so historic projects, big um, public projects very creative, unusual, kind of quirky architectural projects. Um, so I'd say it's the diversity that makes us um, unique. Yeah, definitely the diversity of projects and also as, like speaking from a design standpoint, I think um, I think we specialize in agility, you know, working on a bridge one day, master plan the next, the crown of a building on an important skyline the next. I think that's fun. It's, you know, it keeps you on your toes, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, we're able to work with other designers, which so I love the collaborative element of it, and also um, that we're just kind of able to kind of translate and change sometimes what other designers are doing into like the 24-hour experience of experiencing those environments, interiors, landscape, exterior, um, to give it a nighttime impression, and I think that that can allow for like a magic and a, and a kind of translation that's really interesting. I think also anyone can specify a light. You can open a catalogue, old school, look on a, look on a website <laughs> and, um, and specify a light and that, and that happens in so many buildings and you get really mundane, ordinary, lit functional spaces and what we do is kind of craft an experience and the, the lit environment is so fundamental to how you experience a space and your perception of a space and your, you know, the way that people use a space and the behaviour within it. Mm. Future of lighting. I'd say, I reckon there are three big sort of chapters. One, I think, is like biology, understanding more and more what impact light's having on psychology, physiology, um, you know, psyche, everything. So biology, I think environment, more and more about sustainability and, um, you know, electricity and impact we're having on, on nature. Um, and then I think tech, you know, as, as people develop more and more bits of kit and, um, just the way that we work will, will differ, you know, LEDs, obviously everything is shrinking and getting, uh, changing the way that we can use light. I'm both excited and terrified by it because I think that the technology is moving so fast and we're creating a series of different things that are um, on one side um, kind of easing the way we work and the way we move through our life, but on the other side have these the kind of residual effects that we don't quite understand yet. Mm -hmm. And and that does worry me a little bit. Um, like, so I'm both excited and kind of terrified giving it to me. Second yeah, when, when LEDs have been around, you know, in 10 years time, we're suddenly going to figure out all this stuff that we had no idea was impacting yeah. us. Um, and, um, you know, new stuff will be around by that point that will we'll be contributing to it as well. So yeah, it is, it's why research is so important yeah. so people can understand what it is that we're, we're doing. We've both mentioned about impact on, um, well, psychology, I guess, is the bit that interests me most, the sort of uh, impact that 
light can have on on sort of behaviour and mood. You think about seasonal affective disorder and things like that. It would be really interesting to know what sort of obviously we know about natural light, but what artificial light sources um, impact would have um, on people. I recently just discovered a. I don't know if everyone else in the light industry already knows about this, and I'm really late to the game, but. Uh, there's a there's a place called the the light salon, and I think lots of places do it. They have these light machines, is what they call them, where they um, give you a kind of a light therapy session, um, and they basically try to induce this state of hypnagogia, which is the the state between um, being awake and being asleep. So it's this kind of this uh, um, zone where apparently your creativity is released and apparently Salvador Dali used to, used to sort of try and get himself into this state and Thomas Edison used to get himself into this state. And apparently you can just go and have these light, lights flickered at you to, to induce this state of, um, of well, state of mind. So I mean stuff like that is amazing to, to think what impact it can have. It could be complete garbage but I'm, I'm going to go and try it and see. If I could it would be about understanding human kind of physiology and light because I think light is also used in so many kind of medical, different medical streams, but they're all really targeted. It's, you know, whether it's to um, help children who, um, you know, who are, who are pre-born or whether it's um, um, uh, to just kill bacteria or, but light's used to both like regenerate hair growth as well as um, stop hair growth. So for me, I'm like, how, how can it do all these things? And I just don't think we had tons of money and you were able to kind of pool the studies and understand even cellularly, how it's all working for us, because I think, I, I think it's probably really intense and really, really positive, and almost goes on a kind of avatar quite kind of stream, which I just don't yeah. think we are at the, anywhere near understanding. And, and how that then balances with new technology versus natural light, yeah. you know, is yeah. would be incredibly interesting. It's really <laughs> tricky. It's really tricky because I have like favorites like Gates of Millennium Bridge because it was my first project I cut my teeth on. You know, um, but then there was the Grand Mosque because of the size, and that I, I'd say the Grand Mosque for me is twofold, because um, there's a kind of personal level as well as the professional level. There was at one point in time we were sitting around a table, and there were over 15 people there, and they there were probably 20 to 30 of us actually, but it, I counted it, it represented about 15 different countries and, and kind of cultures, and for me that was amazing because also it was a time of war, but we all were able to sit together and laugh together, even though we were on the opposite sides of something that was pretty extreme in the world. Um, and that just felt really great. And also then, on the professional side, the client was like super supportive and, and allowed details and a kind of ideas and ingenuity that was happening, um, supported those, and, and it was allowed to kind of come to fruition. So for me, that was pretty special. I'm probably similar to you that the first full building that I did um, was the Jewish Community Centre in, in North London. <clears throat> and you know, I learned a huge amount by doing, when the whole building is yours, it's your responsibility from, right from the concept through to programming right at the end and dealing with clients. And so that, that for me was quite a cut my teeth um, project. But then the most recent, one of the most recent projects we've completed, the Macallan, um, it's probably the other one that just in terms of um, like dream projects, great architecture, brilliant team, really interesting combination between very technical um, sort of industrial lighting and then very creative theatrical lighting. Um, so it's really nice to do quite creative thinking right at the very beginning and then actually see it realised. So that's probably my most proud current project. <coughs> Um, we have all the same answers. Yeah, I, I think probably. Well, actually, you know what? When I when I first started out in lighting, pre kids, the biggest challenge was work life balance because I was learning a new craft and I knew nothing about it and I needed to work incredibly hard to to put the hours in to to get the knowledge to be experienced enough to be trusted with with projects. And then and then children came along and then uh, the balance of, of figuring out work life balance with children is is hard. It's the juggle. It's it's just life, basically. I think, um, you know, you you kind of work through every day. I've had the kind of luck to be able to work professionally with amazing people, um, but you've also see those people come and go to their own choices, and you know, um, lots of different things, and you know, horrendous leave and death, and and um, and also then introducing a family into that, and you know, lucky enough to be able to continue doing what I love with a family, um, but also. Um, I think, I think that is just the biggest challenge, just life. And I would say 
that there is no balance. Like everybody's like the work life, but there, it, it's a constant juggle, and you're constantly trying to just rework it and find new boat shoes, and you know, just trying to. That's why I describe <laughs> it to everybody. You know, got my new boat shoes on, and we'll just see how this month goes. And, and, and that is, and that's, it's a good challenge, though. It's positive. I think. Yeah. I've got a couple. Um, I mean, Mark has to be Mark Major, absolutely. From joining as a very assistant, very young designer, um, he was kind of a mentor throughout. Someone who was both, you know, my boss, but also a friend, and really interested in development of my career and my interests. And um, so he he certainly has been a big influence. Um, and then thinking more in the kind of topic of women in lighting, there are, there are two women. Um, first used to work uh, with us, Emily Dufner, and then went on to. Um, work for Arup and, and run their California office and she was I think the first um, woman in the office who she ran my team and just decided to kind of run things do things a little bit differently um, was very feminine in her approach but really um, inspirational in terms of you know you can you can challenge ideas you can do things your own way so I I found her um, an inspiration and um, another is a client actually who um, Catherine Herschel is uh, a client of ours from Alma Kanta, who's um, the developer for Centerpoint and Marble Arch. And I had worked with her on, on Centerpoint by that point, I think for about two years or so. Um, was still a reasonably, a sort of project designer level maybe, and completely un, um, sort of unasked for, she wrote a, an email to Mark, just singing my praises, saying that, you know, he, she thought I was really great and he should keep hold of me and I had you know places to go and things like that and I thought in terms of kind of female um, mentoring or sort of helping people along it's it's so easy if you're a senior at a senior level uh, a woman to see someone who's doing well but might not be sort of waving their own flag just to kind of just make sure people kind of notice them and I thought for her that probably took her like five minutes between coffees and for me it made a massive difference and Mark, Mark hopefully had already already seen the light, uh, but you know I think it, for him he was like, oh well, you know she thinks she thinks you're great. I think you're great too, you know. So I, I think that was um, a really nice thing for her to do. I mean, I think for me, um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Jonathan because he was kind of um, my early mentor. But to be honest, it, for him it wasn't. It was never about like, mentoring, it was just, everything was just so innate. The innate ins excitement that he had about what we did every day, um, being able to travel and meet people and influence design and it just, um, and also being appreciative of being able to do that. And I think, so for me, I kind of, you know, it just kind of helped see that along, I think, so. Um, and in terms of women, the woman side of it, I think I've worked with a number of, I, I wouldn't list them all probably, but um, strong, Female architects in some of the larger practices in London and New York, and I think that um, I think it's really interesting to, and I've always kind of marked the difference between how they work and how um, the men work. There's there's a kind of quietness to it, which I think is, which I've always thought was really quite positive, and I kind of I think kind of noted that. I guess light continues to inspire all of us probably every time we step outside. I mean, we're we're in. A sudden moment of peaks, sort of spring and winter, and everyone's elated and filled with joy. So I think um, I think natural light for all of us is going to be probably one of the biggest inspirations. Um, and every time you kind of escape the city and go to you know anywhere rural or abroad, or you you see the different sort of qualities of light, and then you come back to a city and you realise even more how important it is when when we don't have the the beach or the whatever it is that's your beautiful natural light surroundings. We're, we're framing our environment with artificial light and, and therefore the way that we do it is, is so important. I think it's surprise as well. Like I'm surprised by it every day. Even when I think from experience, I know how something's gonna turn out. There's always something to learn from, like daily, which still catches me off guard sometimes when I think I know this and you're teaching a junior designer and you're like, oh, the detail should be, and then you look and you're like, wow, that's totally different. So I'm always like, mock it up, show the materials, kind of really you need to, Kind of, you know, constantly study, and I think that's amazing because it, it means you're constantly learning, which mm -hmm. is really enjoyable on a daily basis. I think. I think I think one of the biggest reasons why there's a sort of a, a, an uneven distribution of men and women at the highest levels. I think 
people who talk at conferences tend to be the people running uh, practices or, or at a senior level, is fundamentally that women have babies and the majority of them take a longer chunk of time out of their career, maybe a few times, and until parental leave is equally shared between men and women and men take various little pockets of time out of their career, women will be sort of held back because you've had a bit of time out, you're not climbing the, the ladder as hard, you might go back part time. Um, and if everyone does that because that's just part of bringing up the population, um, then I think it would be a lot more even. I think more, more women would be able to, to get to more senior positions. Tony, I'm glad you said that because I was going to say it and I thought, is it inappropriate with a child in the No, room? no. Are we, making, are we making something? But I do think it's true and I said it to a male colleague recently and he was like, oh, not the, in this day and age, it's not true. I said, of course it is. You know, I've taken two maternity leaves and there's an effect. And I said, but it goes back to that life juggle. It's like you, you're picking and choosing what you want to do and you can't be master of everything. It's just not a reality. So you, you, you kind of juggle and you say, well, what's important? And I can't be, you know, um, you can't put everything at the forefront. And so you choose how to balance what you want to do and you just have to be happy with it in the moment that you're making those choices. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, it's not super negative that, that women aren't there, but at the same time it, it is a bit, um, you know, it's disappointing when you, you would like to hear, I think, um, yeah. other women's opinions and stuff. I also think, though, that there's, um, that is a major thing, but I also think there's a different, and I hate being stereotypical between men and women, but I also do kind of believe that um, there's an ego thing. And I just, do, I don't think women have the same kind of um, ego in, in which to put themselves forward in terms of um, championing themselves. Yeah, championing themselves. They, they commit themselves to their work. They're totally in it. Their heart's in it. The effort's in it. Um, and they work and they kind of get through it and get through it. But it's not about, okay, let me scream about what I've just been done. It's just like, okay, what's next? You know, what's next? Keep going, keep going. And, um, and so it just doesn't it doesn't come across in that way and when you have a life and it's complicated and you're balancing all of these things you know let me speak at a lecture next month isn't always on your this year's goal list you know <laughs> it's it you know it's it you know it's a shame yeah but, I think uh, also the 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 sort of gender stereotypes are there because there are differences you know not everyone but there are mm -hmm. some differences and I think um, women sort of typically don't I guess there's a different sort of approach uh, to challenges. I think guys, from what we've experienced from sort of people who apply for jobs, for instance, there tends to be more of a, um, I've got you know half the skills to get there. I can, I'm sure I'll I'll figure it out. Um, give it, give me a chance. And I think girls are a bit more like, well, I'll wait until I absolutely know everything, and then I'll you know I'll be really really qualified, and then give me the job. Um, so I think that's a bit of a yeah, difference. I mean, there's all the um, I don't know if you everyone, everyone's read Lean In. Cheryl Sandberg, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, there's lots of stuff about, you know, for all we may love her or hate her, um, there's there's a lot of research behind what she's written and things like that, that, you know, wh women sort of hold themselves back a little bit. Um, I mean, I remember when I started out, um, and, and actually still to this day, I'm often the only woman in a meeting with like 18 guys, um, and I'm often the youngest person in the room and the only woman. And so, I mean, I, you know, I, I make a point of making sure that in every meeting I have something intelligent and worthwhile to, to say so that people know that they should listen to me and I'm not just there taking notes for someone else. Um, and I think that's really important for all women to do, to sort of make themselves heard and, and realize, make people realize that they're, they're an important yeah. contribution to the room. I think um, the point I made earlier on that if you go to meetings and you are the only woman, make sure that you you sort of shine, you know, show people, work really hard to know your topic and be good at what you do and then kind of show it off. I would say, I would say just keep going. Um, do your thing, be yourself, be kind of true to yourself and, and if you fall or get knocked over, you know, just, like I said before, kind of adjust the sails and kind of keep on going and don't be afraid to ask, especially because what's really interesting about this project is like we're here, you know, there's a lot of us here. We might be quiet, but we're still here. And and um, one of the things I was going to say in the kind of how do you think we could change it um, part of the last question is um, I think women respond differently if they're asked. Like we were asked to kind of do this. And I think if it had been on the website, I would have been like, oh, maybe, you know, and then I would have missed the deadline. 
you know, <laughs> because I would have been like, oh, that's not as important as what, you know. Um, and I think that for me, um, most of the women I know are really into kind of being part of a community and helping out. And and so if it's not about just, it's not just about me, it's about this bigger thing and it's more important and we're going to do it together. And people are more likely to kind of contribute. And I think that, you know, it doesn't take much to say, hey, you know, why don't you talk about this project? Because most of the time when somebody asks me, I'm, I say yes, whether I should or not, but I, you know. At the yeah. time, sometimes I'm like, I wish I, but, um, but you know, you say yes because I, I think there is a kind of community thing that's really positive for females in general.